Good morning. Good morning, everyone. I am Kirsten Hunter, the Director of Lifespan Ministries here at South Church, serving in co-leadership with Reverend Ellen Quadgrass, and serving in co-ministry with all of you. Thank you for the ministries you bring to this community. Welcome to all of you, those of you who are new and just getting to know our community, and those of you who have been sitting in the same pew for more than 30 years, and everyone in between, and to our friends who are joining us online, thank you for being here. We invite you to open the live chat and say good morning to one another if you are so inclined. Interdependence is the theme that we are exploring throughout this month. It is one of the values articulated in the UUA's proposed update to Article 2, which if you have no idea what I just said, feel free to come talk to me after service. The section of language addressing interdependence feels particularly relevant today. This is what it says. As Unitarian Universalists, we honor the interdependent web of all existence with reverence for the great web of life and with humility. We acknowledge our place in it. We covenant to protect the earth and all beings from exploitation. We will create and nurture sustainable relationships of care and respect, mutuality and justice. We will work to repair harm and damaged relationships. That sounds easy. <laughs> In that spirit, each week we acknowledge that the land where we are gathered was land stolen centuries ago from indigenous people, including the Abenaki and the Penacook, who have known their role as stewards of our Mother Earth for millennia, and who are a people for whom justice and self-determination has long been withheld. As a community, we name this as one small step toward the long journey of that work of repairing harm and repairing damaged relationships, both with indigenous people here in New Hampshire, across the world, and also with the land itself, our Mother Earth. I encourage you to take a look at your order of service today for details about this worship and everything that is happening in our community. Leading worship with me today is worship associate Chris Kuiper. Music today will be offered by our pianist Susan Adams, our director of music ministry Johnny Pfeiffer, and Jen Leiden. Ben Abbott is handling our sound and video. Thanks, Ben. After the Time for All Ages this morning, all of our young people are invited to attend our religious education classes downstairs in the company of Jen Deldeo Berry and a fantastic team of volunteers. Parents, if you have young ones, please walk them down and get them signed in before returning up here to the sanctuary. And finally, everyone of every age is invited to join us in the fellowship hall after service for coffee, treats, and conversation. We have assisted listening devices and large print hymnals in the back. Please ask an usher if you need assistance. Please take a moment to silence your cell phones if you have one. And now for some announcements. Good morning, everyone. Um, one really big, overarching senior youth announcement. There are four senior youth fundraisers coming up. Uh, today, downstairs, the senior youth will be having our fair trade coffee and chocolate sale, so definitely check that out. And while you're down there, you can sign up for a prepared meal sale. They are pre-ordering prepared meals today, 
and next Sunday for folks to pick up on the 28th, so you can find out some information downstairs about that. We're also going to be having our annual Mother's Day plant sale on Mother's Day, so there'll be some information coming out soon about that. And you may have also noticed when you came in the Tupperware or Rubbermaid tubs in the narthex that say books. The senior youth are collecting gently used books for a used book sale that will also be held on June 2nd downstairs. And they'll be collecting those books through May 31st. So we've got fair trade today, meals today, and next week for pickup on the 28th, Mother's Day plant sale on Mother's Day, and then the book sale um, on June 2nd. And also just want to point out real quick that um, this coming Saturday, Cindy Brown will be leading the spring garden cleanup. So if you're interested in helping get the gardens ready for spring and summer, come on down for that. And uh, pocket garden blooms are being sold downstairs during coffee hour as well. If you're interested in um, honoring or memorializing somebody um, for the uh, pocket garden tour. I think that's it. You want to come on down and do the invocation with me? So this song that we're going to do for the um, invocation is a call and response. I'm going to lead, and Susan and Kirsten, you guys are going to sing with Susan and Kirsten, um, who are going to be the congregation today. So it's really easy. I know you guys will catch on. Tell them the words. Oh, and there's three words. Moon, don't go. That's it. That's all you got. Moon, don't go. Moon, don't go. Moon, don't go. Moon, don't go. Moon 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 don't go. You guys did great. As we light our chalice here, we invite people watching at home to light a candle or chalice of their own. We light this chalice today with these words from an unknown author. What am I without the sun, without the electromagnetic field, without the Higgs boson, without plants, algae, biosphere, or ozone layer? I don't exist. Me, as a separate thing, is actually a misnomer. It doesn't even exist. Please rise in body or in spirit and join me in reciting the mission statement printed in your order of service. At South Church, we nurture spiritual growth through worship, learning, and community. We celebrate the worth and dignity of all people and inspire one another to act on our faith in the larger community. I found myself unexpectedly sitting at a park in Newburyport yesterday, overlooking a river, chatting with Kirsten on the phone about interdependence and trying to figure out what to say today. <laughs> and as we talked, I was watching this construction site in front of me, all the kind of telltale signs of human intervention, huge yellow excavators and stacks of granite curbing and piles of gravel. And it reminded me of all the construction sites that I've worked on in my life, which is quite a few. As an accomplice in the destruction of ecosystems and the burial of so much plastic tubing, concrete foundations, metal piping, PVC, into the ground. And while rationally I know that all that infrastructure will provide humans with shelter and water and electricity, on a spiritual level, 
It makes me feel sad. It gives me feelings of guilt and shame to cut down trees and dig a hole and fill it with concrete and all of our non-compostable necessities. It makes me feel sad because I'm applying meaning to it. That I'm over here with the wasteful, selfish, insatiable humans and the trees and the dirt and the habitat are over there with the natural world. Right now feels like a critical moment in the health of our interdependence with ecological systems and our interdependence with technological systems. As we struggle to remember and pass along the ways of our ancestors who lived in many ways more harmoniously, we're enchanted and distracted by the promise of a more digital future. We are this amazing species that can invent and adapt and manipulate our environment. And isn't it even more amazing that we are part of a larger system, a larger organism of everything? The way that cells make up our organs and our tissues and our bones and all those things make up our bodies. We are like the cells of the earth, bouncing off one another, sharing hydrogens and carbons and stories and prayers. I think if we could see molecules the way we can see pixels on a large TV screen, we'd see how literally connected we are with everything. Vibrating quarks interacting with vibrating quarks. On my drive home from Newburyport, I noticed an interesting housing development um, off of Route 1, so I pulled over to check it out, which is what you do. The homes were, were very attractive and modest, and I noticed they were densely and intentionally spaced. And as I looked around, I saw solar arrays covering parking spaces, and I saw rainwater catchment systems, and there was a wind turbine across the street, and all the sidewalks were gravel. Somebody really thought about this whole housing place. I saw the sign out front had a, a logo of my friend's permaculture design company. They design living landscapes that, that serve and honor the connection between ecosystems and human systems. So I sat there kind of taking this project in and I got a feeling of hope and of excitement, kind of having just thought about my own negative experience with construction, I was reminded how capable humans are of aiming in the direction of balance. We're not perfect. In fact, as the saying goes, we're only human. I think it's important to acknowledge that we face an ongoing struggle between us and them, between natural and unnatural, between our independent self and this interdependent web. It's been said that we aren't human beings having a spiritual experience, but rather spiritual beings having a human experience. And I think in a similar way, we aren't a spiritual species in a natural world, but rather we are a spiritual species of a natural world. Please rise in body or in spirit for our opening hymn, Building a New Way, number 1017 in the Teal Hymnal. It says 1008 in your order of service. That is not correct. It is 1017. to be 
free We are working to be free We are working to be free Hate and greed and jealousy We are working to be free We can feed our every need our cry. Peace and freedom is our cry. Peace and freedom is our cry. Without these, this world will die. Peace and freedom is our cry. Anybody that might like to hear a story from a little closer up is invited to come up here. Anybody of all ages. I have a story this morning that's kind of built or sort of was inspired by Jen Deby's story last week when she was talking about the invisible web of strings that stretches out all around and across our whole planet. Did you guys hear that story? And I was thinking about that story and I was thinking, but if it's invisible, how do we remember? Does anyone know? What do we do, how, what? If we're supposed to remember there's this invisible web, but it's invisible, how do we remember? How do you think? Can you run into it? Maybe you can run into it. I like that. Yeah, any other ideas? Can you imagine it? Imagine it, yeah. Run into it, imagine it. A map of a web? A map? Maybe there's a map of it? That's a great idea. A song. A song or a story to remind us about it? I thought it. Uh, it happens to me too. My brain is an invisible web sometimes. I can feel it right now. Jen can feel it right now. Oh my gosh. One more. A diary. A diary. What would you put in the diary? Secrets. Secrets. What, would those secrets have to do with experiences of the invisible web, maybe? Maybe. That's what I came up with, was kind of everything you all just said was, it isn't always invisible. We catch glimpses of it, right? We bump into it in different ways. We map it. We remember it. We feel it, right? So... I have a story about that, about feeling the invisible web. And the story starts way back when I was nine years old. Actually, the story does not start when I was nine years old, but that's where we're going to come in. Okay? So, when I was nine years old, my dad was a dad who loved astronomy. Do you know what that is? Astronomy is all of, is, is studying and observing and watching all of the stars and the planets and the nebula and everything out in space, the study of, of space. And my dad was pretty obsessed with astronomy, which meant on more times than I can count, I would be sleeping really cozy in my bed and I would be woken up by a star-crazed person who would be standing over me going, hurry up, hurry up, you're going to miss the magic. 
And I would open my eyes and be like, what, what, what? And dad would drag us outside. And sometimes it was because there was a convergence of planets, which honestly, for a kid, I got to say, I did not find all that exciting. <laughs> But my dad thought it was really cool. Sometimes there was a lunar eclipse. Sometimes there was a meteor shower. Sometimes it was just a very crisp night, and he wanted us to see the stars. Sometimes there was a comet that I could barely see at all, but he swore it was right where I was looking. Night after night through my childhood, these are things that happened. And me and my brothers would stumble outside and out to a field somewhere with dad to look at the stars. And, sort of related to that, when my older brother graduated from high school and I was in my junior year about to finish high school, my dad and mom planned an epic family adventure to go all the way to Mexico to see a total eclipse of the sun. Have you ever heard of such a thing? So we got in a family, we had a Georgie boy RV, six of us, plus three dogs, and we drove all the way down through Tennessee, across Texas, all the way across the country of Mexico to the far side coast to a little town called San Blas, and that was where I found out that there are a lot of people in the world just like my dad. So, in San Blas, there was star chasers, there was eclipse chasers, there were people obsessed with the sky, and they all came there because it was one of the spots that they said was going to be a great spot for seeing this total solar eclipse. And within instant seconds of meeting each other, they were all best friends, they were all excited. We were watching the whole thing like, what is going on with these people? But sure enough, the day of the eclipse, we gathered on this big cement bandstand by the beach, and there was about 40 people, and all of us, it was like we'd known each other forever. The amount of kindness and openness and sharing and talking and joy that was in the air was really cool. And somebody had a telescope that we were projecting as the moon was coming across the sun, we could see the shadow on the ground and watch it. And we were passing around glasses because we didn't have enough for everybody. And people were sharing snacks and sharing stories, and we watched. And right before totality, clouds came in. <laughs> And we didn't really see the total eclipse, but it was still really cool, and it got dark, and we felt the air change, and we noticed the animals change, but it was a little bit of a disappointment, too. And so we found our way through the rest of that big family journey, and then... 26 years later, in 2017, my own son was about to graduate from high school, and we went on another epic family trip all the way to Wyoming to see a total eclipse of the sun. And by now, I was right in with my dad, one of those crazy people that loves the, sky, the stars in the sky. And in Wyoming, we did see totality in the shadow of the Grand Tetons, and it was amazing. And the birds got very quiet as the eclipse started, and all of the people had this feeling of excitement, and when the ring appeared, the noises that we listened to coming from one another and from the natural world were otherworldly. It was the coolest thing. And then, guess what happened on Monday? No! No clouds for me, but maybe for some of us. It happens sometimes, but I was in Rangeley, Maine, and once again, I was standing on a piece of granite in the middle of a frozen lake, surrounded by evergreen trees, as the darkness started to come. And just before the total eclipse, me and all of the people around me were feeling the air and noticing the changing temperature. And on the ground came these rippling shadows called shadow bands that made the snow-covered lake look like it was moving water. And it had been really quiet all day, but as the totality started, the birds started to sing. And so did the people. Everybody went, ah! Oh! 
oh my gosh, and you could hear the calls out through the air and watch this magic, magic thing. And my parents, I knew, were in Austin, Texas to see the eclipse. And so I imagined not just the people that I was with, but the people they were with and the people they were hugging with joy and every group of people, millions of people all along the way as the moon danced with the sun moving across the country and all of us seeing that together. And I thought, wow, one big happy family. That's my story and you guys can go down. During the month of April, our collection will be shared with Seacoast Pathways, a place for adults living with mental illness to come together for purposeful work and meaningful relationships with a clubhouse model. A clubhouse is a restorative environment for people who have had their lives drastically disrupted and need the support of others who believe that recovery from mental illness and successfully managing the effects of brain injury is possible for all. Please give as you are able. The offering will now be gratefully received. We give thanks for this precious day. We're all gathered here in those far away. For this time we share with love and care. Oh, we give thanks for this precious day. to a time of prayer or a meditation. Settle into the seat. 
Turn in toward your body. Notice your breath. Notice your heartbeat. This morning I ask all of us to hold Hillary Clark in our hearts following the death of her mom yesterday. Deborah Thayer Perry Clark was an adventurous spirit and a lover of life, people, songs, and dogs. She was an active member of the Concord, Massachusetts UU Church for many years, and she will be missed. Hmm. Prayer feels important today. It's hard to pay attention to the world and take care of your heart at the same time. Watching humans making enemies of one another is hard to bear. The news of escalating warfare across the Middle East overnight is overwhelming and terrifying. The ongoing news from Gaza continues to break our hearts the news from Ukraine and Russia, from Sudan, from Congo, from Korea, from Washington, from legislators across the country peddling hate to earn votes. Here in New Hampshire, too, it's hard to pay attention to the world and take care of our hearts. I am praying today for all of the leaders in all of the countries and states and cities. I am praying for them to search for opportunities to de-escalate, to unify, to heal. I am praying for wisdom rooted in compassion. I am praying for brave vision that can see peace beyond the violence of this tragic and divisive time. This is a poem written by Warson Shire. She's a Kenyan Somali poet, and it's titled, What They Did Yesterday Afternoon. They set my aunt's house on fire. I cried the way women on TV do, folding at the middle like a five pound note. I called the boy who used to love me, tried to okay my voice. I said, hello. He said, Warsan, what's wrong? What's happened? I've been praying. And these are what my prayers look like. Dear God, I come from two countries. One is thirsty. The other is on fire. Both need water. Later that night, I held an atlas in my lap, ran my fingers across the whole world, and whispered, where does it hurt? And it answered, everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. In the quiet of this morning, as the sun rises in the sky. Let us gather our hearts together and whisper a prayer for the world. Your hearts matter to me and to Reverend Ellen and to every other person in this community. If you are struggling or if you are celebrating joy, we want to know. Reach out, tell us. Call if you need support. 
Ask for help. Lean. Offer help. Give. I'm going to invite anyone who would like to come forward to light a candle of joy or of concern to do so now.
So this sermon is an interdependent web of stories. It is an ode to all of my human siblings to help us remember that we belong to this earth and that we have blessed gifts to offer her and each other. It begins with the sign in the garden bed in front of my house, which I bought from our social justice associates many years ago, which says, we are here to awaken from the illusion of our separateness. And the edges of the sign are crumbling and the ink is flaking off. And I have been thinking about replacing it or taking it down, but I keep thinking about the added layers of meaning it reflects in its aging form. We speak about interdependence, an invisible web, and I like expanding the metaphor with that sign, suggesting that we remember sometimes and we also forget where we recognize we belong to this world and to one another in moments like during a solar eclipse or when we see a sustainable building or receive help from an unexpected place, something that illuminates our oneness with everything and the life, and then life keeps going and slowly or quickly we forget again. The ink starts to flake off. The message fades. We get distracted. Thich Nhat Hanh, the Buddhist monk and author of my lawn sign message, also wrote these words. You are me, and I am you. Isn't it obvious that we inter are? You cultivate the flower in yourself so that I will be beautiful I transform the garbage in myself so that you will not have to suffer. I support you. You support me. I am in this world to offer you peace. You are in this world to bring me joy. Now, perhaps more than ever before, we need to understand and we need to teach our children to understand that we inter are. We are up against some challenges. The illusion of separateness pervades our culture. In the US, individualism is cherished. It is taught to us through our origin stories and through so many traditions. Life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. We construct narratives that emphasize our individuality, our autonomy, our exceptionalism, our perceived control over things. Profit is overvalued. We too often judge one another and ourselves based on measurements of wealth and how self-sufficient we can be. We hate asking for help, and by not doing so, we make it so much harder for anyone else to ask for help. We criminalize poverty. We grasp at identity and cling to ego and build walls around our hearts. Fear whispers in our ears that vulnerability is weakness that to acknowledge our interdependence is to surrender control. We are taught to compete more than to cooperate. And perhaps most terrifying, we are in a place now where the vast majority of our planet's resources and most of our political leaders across the globe are controlled by a tiny percentage of obscenely wealthy people who don't have our best interest in mind. But this today is a sermon of hope and of potential. 
because I believe we are awakening to that illusion of our separateness. I believe more and more of us are realizing that surrendering control is liberating, that interdependence is not weakness, it is our greatest strength, that beneath the narratives that separate us, there is a deeper truth. And I don't believe that humanity is a lost cause. The very things that make us human are the things that give me hope. Maybe the most important of those things that make us human is our capacity for awe and wonder. It is a superpower that can reset our minds and break us free from old patterns. My story about the eclipse was just one example. Awe and wonder can come from all kinds of places, music and art and nature and love. All tremendous sources of that kind of inspiration. And when we're stuck, if we remember that that is fuel for creativity, it may be the very thing that will save us. Stop and find wonder. So it's a good thing that as humans, we also have this capacity for memory. We keep so much information here. We can catalog enormous, enormous amounts of ideas and reminders. Our brains can remember that we thrive on awe and wonder, and then they can prod us when we're running out of steam to go and find it, to go and play Stevie Wonder really loud in your living room and dance, or go walk outside and lay in the grass and stare at the birds. Our capacity for memory also allows us to do so many other things. Last week in her sermon, Reverend Ellen spoke so beautifully about another example of how this human thing lives in our lives, and that is our capacity to connect with our ancestors, which is such a practice of interdependence building awareness of our ancestors' stories, realizing that those stories live within us, that is a kind of memory. We also then begin to realize we can heal harms. We can change our relationship with people who have died. That's incredible. We can change the past, the present, and the future all at once just by spending time with our memory of one another. Memory in relationship with interdependence is fascinating. I could preach a whole sermon on it, but Ellen already did some of that for us last week. It is a fluid thing. It invites curiosity and growth and healing, and it deepens our connections to one another. So this leads me to two more things that are remarkable about humans. We are learners, and we are teachers. Every new idea we encounter has the potential to change us, and every idea we share has the potential to change others. My dad taught me to appreciate the stars, and in doing so, he opened my mind to the vastness of the universe and changed the course of my life. And I, I could not list all of the remarkable teachers in my life who have done the same. I'll pick one. Robin Wall Kimmerer, and the author of the book Braiding Sweetgrass, she is a remarkable teacher in my life and I have never even met her. She has taught me just through putting words on paper another amazing thing about human beings. We can put words on paper. We can affect people we never meet. One of the lessons I learned from Robin Wall Kimmerer was an invitation to recognize my place within nature, rather than seeing myself as separate from it. And maybe I'd said those words before, but I really hadn't integrated that understanding until I read her book. It was revelatory to me. 
I hadn't even thought about how I see myself as separate from the natural world, an observer, someone who tends to it, who dips in and out of it. But her point is, we are it. We are the natural world. And that is a total change of framework. That changes everything about how I look at the world. I've been thinking about it for years since I read those chapters. She explains that we are not mere observers, we are active participants, and that we thrive when we work together with every other thing in this incredible ecosystem, exchanging unique gifts within that intricate web of life. She elucidates the concept of reciprocity, teaching us that land, plant, animals contribute to our well-being and in return we have a responsibility to care for them. It is not transactional, it is relational. Reciprocity fosters harmonious existence. And touching back on that memory thing, ancestors she connects to and draws her insights from are lifted up in her words. She does not profess to have come up with these ideas by herself. She reaches back, she brings them forward, she passes them around and shares all of the other wide voices across the web with us. One tiny example she shares, and I quote, in some native languages, the term for plants translates to take those who take care of us. Imagine if our language, the language we use every day, could be reinforcing our awareness of our interdependence. It certainly can shield us from it. And once you think about that, and you start to think about the words we use, you start to choose different words. A few months ago, in a meeting of the Committee on Ministries, one of our members was reading back some meeting notes, and there was a list. And before they read the list, they paused to explain that they're trying not to use language that glorifies violence. And so instead of saying bullet points, they said polka dots. And my heart grew two sizes that day. <laughs> it might seem small or silly, but our words matter. Thinking about our values and how they may live in our language matters. That is spiritual practice. That is something that is miraculous about human beings and something that we do. We need more of that in this world. We feel awe and wonder. We hold memory. We use language. We learn. We teach. We also build. Chris shared a feeling I know all of us have at different points in our days and weeks, a feeling of shame that we are complicit in humankind's broken covenant with our own planet. I can imagine that working in construction, there are regular reminders of our species' oversized footprint and our obtuse approach to using this human gift of building I can promise that that's true in, in my life, too, and in my line of work, so I'm guessing it's true for all of us. We shouldn't ignore that feeling of shame or guilt. It has a purpose. It can be healthy when it compels us to do better, when it allows us to see mistakes we've made, acknowledge them, and work toward making less of them, toward fixing them, toward repair. It's important, and so is our ability to then build, envision, plan, execute something new, something that is more sustainable, that is more reciprocal. The very human qualities that have allowed us to cause harm are the very same things that can help us to fix the harm we have caused. And that leaves me with one more thing that I want to share about humans that affects all of the rest 
and gives me hope for our interdependent existence. We are compassionate, relational beings by nature. We have the capacity to form connections that transcend our individual perspectives and enable cooperation, collaboration, and progress. Buddhist teacher Pema Chodron explains a core component of this last thing about humans. Compassion, she says, is not a relationship between healer and wounded. It is a relationship between equals. Compassion becomes real when we recognize our shared humanity, or in the context of this sermon, our shared existence with all of life. We have to see it as a relationship between equals. We have to belong to it. We have to be in it to truly be compassionate. You cannot be compassionate to someone or something that you are looking down upon. We, human, beautiful human beings, can navigate incredibly complicated challenges, situations that require compromise and sacrifice. We can do that within compassionate relationship. I learned a lot about that lesson during the COVID pandemic. As a congregation, we faced challenging questions related to vaccines and masking and how long to close the building and when to reopen it and what it would look like when we did. We didn't all agree on those answers because they affected each of us differently. The decisions that had to be made required compromise and sacrifice. We did not make perfect decisions because there were no perfect decisions to be made. Every choice involved negative consequences. I know there are some people who were disappointed by our different decisions throughout that time, but I was incredibly proud of the compassion our community maintained as we found our way through that long and painful period. I am proud that our decisions centered safety and inclusiveness. I was inspired by the ways that volunteers and staff showed up, the deep learning that we did to figure out how to connect by live streams and Zoom calls. I was touched by the leaders who sat through challenging discussions, spoke hard truths, worked hard to be kind and honest and transparent about the decisions they made. I was so grateful for the trust that we had already built as a community which held us through it all. We are practicing interdependence here, here in this place with each other. So while we grapple with our flaws, let's also celebrate our potential by harnessing our capacity to feel awe and wonder, to remember, to learn, to teach, to build, to practice compassion. We are building a better world, one polka dot at a time. Amen. Let's sing a hymn, okay? 1064. Oh, 
We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. I invite you to stand if you wish and put your hand on the shoulder of someone near you. This is a poem. <laughs> All right, settle down, you lovies. <laughs> this is a poem by Dorian Locks. It's titled, In Any Event. If we are fractured, we are fractured like stars, bred to shine in every direction, through any dimension billions of years since and hence. I shall not lament the human, not yet. There is something more to come. Our hearts a gold mine not yet plumbed, an uncharted sea, nothing is gone forever. If we came from dust and we'll return to dust, then we can find our way into anything. What we are capable of is not yet known. And I praise us now in advance. <laughs> 